We're keeping our community engaged and inspired wherever they are. We're bringing together designers and industry insiders for some great conversations online. These webinars shine a light on creative partnerships and today's session working together is spot on, especially as we will be talking to a renowned husband and wife team. I'm delighted to introduce Stefan and Monique Tolgard, and who better to moderate the session than Charlotte Abrahams. With so much to discuss, there may not be time for questions and answers. So without further ado, I'm handing over to Charlotte and thank you all for tuning in. Thanks, Claire, and a very warm welcome to today's design date. Um, partners in both life and design, Stefan and Monique Tolgard uh, founded the Tolgard Design Group in 2005. In the uh, 15 years since, um, the studio has grown into a multidisciplinary award-winning practice encompassing interiors, product design, and contract design. Um, their work is hugely varied across the, across the different disciplines, but the thing that really unites it all is a commitment to the power of storytelling. Stefan and Monique, this idea of narrative, um, and I think the, the red thread, I think you call it, is, is absolutely essential to the, the Tolgard design aesthetic. And you both share a background in film and um, documentary production. And I wondered how that tied into this and where that, whether that's where this belief in narrative and its importance comes from. Um, I, I think we are first and foremost storytellers, um, maybe first and foremost listeners and then storytellers, because actually if we can't listen to our clients first, um, we can't, um, take in their story and then tell it using the language of design. So we actually met on a film set. Um, <laughs> I was the actress um, for the, for the budget feature film. Um, and Stefan was the first AD, um, the first assistant director. So it's a real cliche, right? You're not, um, you're not meant to, your relationship isn't meant to endure um, if you fall in love on a film set. But thankfully, right. <laughs> while um, our first careers didn't endure, um, the marriage and the partnership has. Um, and I think in finding this career, we found an outlet for storytelling and actually, you know, for pro problem solving because Stefan's first degree was in engineering. So we're a family of engineers and storytellers. That's a per perfect skills actually to, to bring to, to a design practice. How do, you, how do you work together? I think when you started out, you worked very much together and now you head up different sections of the business. Well, I think initially um, Monique joined kind of a, a year in to uh, the start of the practice. And I, I think we, we did work on the same projects. And I think quite quickly as the as studio grew, we realized that we needed our own space, you know, being partners um, at home, at work, uh, mm -hmm. kind of seeing each other 24 seven, it was quite important to kind of carve out your own um, little bit. And initially, I think that just meant that we worked on on um, separate projects. We helped each other, but we we kind of um, headed up different projects. And as the company grew, it meant heading up different divisions. So now Monique is head of the interior design studio. As a creative director, I still work in the studio, but I also make sure that the showrooms um, have the right products in them. Um, and I work on product design myself. And as well as this, this shared belief in, the, in, in storytelling, do you have very different approaches and, and aesthetics? And I mean, we've been together 22 years, so that's, you know, half my life. Um, and I think what's actually become quite interesting is how our design values um, and our aesthetic have really grown together. Um, I wouldn't say that we have a house style. I mean, obviously we have very strongly held values um, and a philosophy and a way of working on a project. So you touched on the red thread and I did not answer that part of the question. So I will, I will say, <laughs> um, you know, we, every project is about finding this red thread um, mm -hmm. and it's a Northern European idea and actually I had never heard of it um, I'm South African and so when Stefan was talking about something and he said no 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 that's the red thread that's the the nub I, what what is this thing what is this red thread and it's it's the binding argument that a piece any piece of creative work turns back to and it's the reason you know you tell the story you either make the movie or you write the song and for us that is um the the creative 
connection between mm. environment, where has the client chosen to live their life? Mm. Architecture, what shape is this building that they're fitting their life into? An identity. And if we can bring those three things together, um, we tell a different story every time. How interesting. Okay. And that's a, that's a Northern Europe. It's not sort of term I come across until I started doing research mm. into you. Yeah, there, there is actually um, something similar in Germany, um, all of Scandinavia, and mm-hmm. there is a, a red thread expression in Japan even, but it means something okay. slightly different. Okay. But for, it's red for, thread of fate. Yeah. That binds. But yeah. for us, it, it, it's mm. the essence of the project to kind of be able to boil it down to something. And yeah. we use it all the time because, you know, the, the, the process of designing going from you know, meeting the client, um, getting all of this information out of them, uh, going through concept and eventually into detail, um, you can kind of design your way into a corner quite often. Mm. And the way back is the breadcrumbs of, of the, of the okay. red thread. It's, it's to kind of go back to what was it that we, we said um, that, that this was all about. So, you know, you can express the, the red thread in a complicated way on every project, but it, it could also sometimes just be a kind of a key ingredient you know it can be one piece that you build everything else around um because that was you know so important just for this this one project mm-hmm. how very interesting um and i was got, uh, you know going into this with the interior work you do from that i mean everything you do is a collaboration and um i saw mm-hmm. on your website that you write um we have a strong shared belief that the best in interior design journeys are the shared ones and that thoughtful, responsible, collaborative design should make people lives, make people's lives better. Why, why is that? Why, what does collaborating do? I, I think um, it starts with, with listening. We mm. have a very dear friend who once said that um, his father's um, Tannoy system was only set to broadcast (laughs) rather than to receive. Um, And it's something that we remind ourselves all the time. Mm. You know, we have to broadcast. We Mm. have to be the voice of reason or the voice of um, experience. You know, there's a reason, obviously, that people are employing us to go on this design journey with them. But we have to listen. And so we start with the client. Whenever people ask us, you know, where does your inspiration come from? Of course, it comes from travel and, you know, other design products or the zeitgeist or, you know, other cultures answers to the questions of living. Mm -hmm. But Mm -hmm. fundamentally, it comes from the client. Mm -hmm. And so a collaborative, um, creative design journey starts with us saying, there are Mm -hmm. a million right answers to this house right? Mm, mm. But there's one set of answers uniquely that will make you and your family happiest here. And if we truly understand what makes you happy in a space, we can um, shape it around you and help with the rituals of living and, you know, creating, creating a haven. And I think right now that people are actually spending more time in their homes than Mm. ever, Mm, we've mm. seen the the results so we actually get clients saying we're home so much more and we see everything that you did whereas right. before, you know we were all working so hard you sort of saw your house on the weekends and in the evenings yeah yeah we've got some some pictures of a, of a project you you yeah. worked on quite recently um in, because in i think Danish. something to touch on actually with this project um mm. as well is that collaboration goes beyond collaborating with the client as well. I think to be a really good interior designer, you, 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 you can't approach a project and think that you know all the answers. Mm-hmm. You know, you work, we work with some amazing architects, some amazing lighting designers, some incredible tradespeople, carpenters, um, stone masons, mm-hmm. which, you know, we could never do what we do without them. And it's a collaboration between us and all of those people on the project as well. As That's well really as getting, you know, to get the most out mm-hmm. of a project, it's it's fully understanding the client and then being able to answer that brief, but then mm. to work mm. with with everyone else on the project. That's a really interesting um, point. And with on this project, I think you worked yeah. closely with the architect, didn't you? Yes, this was really? a fantastic opportunity. This is uh, we worked with Knud Holscher, who is, you know, probably the biggest architect in Denmark 
you know, still alive. Mm-hmm. Um, he's in his late 80s and he came out of retirement to work on this little summer house on a, on a Danish island because the, um, our clients convinced him that, <laughs> that they, they desperately needed him. Um, it's, a, wow. it's based on a house he designed decades ago and they wanted him to go back and, and kind of explore that and, and go through the journey once again with them. Um, so the, it was a fantastic collaboration with him. Um, and this project was just full of collaborations actually, because we, there was a, there is a, an amazing joinery called um, Schöpenham's Möbel Snickery, which no one can pronounce. So <laughs> they, they, have, you said that, no, me. <laughs> they, they have rebranded as KBH, which is much easier. And um, yeah. they are Copenhagen based and does design uh, the most beautiful wardrobes, um, fitted joinery, and then have expanded onto um, a furniture as well. Wow. So these pieces actually are designed by us and them together. The, okay. um, uh, the cabinet on your left there houses on this side, on the dining room side, the, the bar and, and crockery. Um, okay. And then on the other side, it houses the television, which is and, and then kind of Clever. works as a division between the two spaces. Mm, mm, um, and that was designed by us, but with, with a lot of help um, from them. Um, the table is a fantastic table because our client is a huge ping pong fan. <laughs> and um, so the, the table was designed to be able to um, push all of the chairs in underneath. Wow. And then to be able to put this beautiful leather, you know, solid brass pillars and leather net onto it. So you can have the family ping pong tournaments after dinner. That is a very beautiful ping pong table, I have to say. <laughs> Um, and you've also um, quite another recent project was a was an office, a commercial space, a so very different. And I think we've got an exclusive preview of, of the images actually. So we're quite excited you about do, it. You, yes. Um, Tell us how that worked because it's it's quite a different process designing designing an office. It is, and 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 not something that we have had the the. Um, you know, the benefit of doing uh, many times. We've worked on, on a few offices, nothing of this scale before. And here the, the client, um, the, the owner of the business, um, we have worked with them, the two founders uh, on many projects before, their private projects and their smaller offices. And when it came to kind of design their new HQ in London, they wanted us as part of the journey, but we, all realized that the project was, was too big for, for our size studio. So we collaborated with BDG, who I think are just an amazing practice within um, uh, workplace design. Mm. And it was it's quite a unique way of working because I was basically seen as a kind of an executive designer sitting on the, on the side of the client. Okay. Um, because I knew them so well and because I knew what they wanted out of it. And also as giving a bit of insight into the residential um, design angle that the, the founders very much wanted. Okay. But BDG were um, the architects and designers in charge of running the whole project. So it was very much their project that I was invited in to collaborate on. And it was so much fun and the result was, Fantastic. We have very happy mm. clients, but mm. I think also BDG and, and myself included were very proud of the results and really enjoyed the process and believe that this process of collaborating um, resulted in a, in a better interior. So yeah. we're very much hoping to do it again. How interesting. And, do you, and we are used to, do you sometimes sort of surprise yourself by what you by what you come up with when you when you work in this in this multi collaboration way? Yes, because I, I think you, you can push ideas so much further mm-hmm. um, when you have a group of people uh, kind of willing each other on. I mean, there's a, there's a you know, theory of design thinking, which is kind of goes throughout lots of different um, businesses, not necessarily mm-hmm. design businesses, where, whereby you invite a group of people in and, and, and in doing so, do you, um, you know, see everything from, from lots of different points of views and I think that's mm. what we really did well here you know they we had different expertise and mm. without any egos and this is this goes back to this idea of 
collaborating on a project with not necessarily with your client but mm. also with with everyone else involved is that mm. it requires you to to have a you know to not have a big ego to be prepared mm. to mm. to listen to everyone and if you do that in a proper way you i truly believe you end up with a with a better design yeah absolutely and and you also design furniture and lighting and accessories for for brands as well don't you and you you'd started off doing that uh, working with Pontali Lighting, and then recently a collection with Parada called Archipelago. And again, I think we've got some some pictures of it. Yes. How does that differ? You know, working with uh, on product design with other other brands. I think it's funny that the um that there's an intrinsic kind of need for for both of us, right? You know, they I can't make things the way they they make things. They they mm -hmm. make the most beautiful wood, um, leather, metal. Um, mm. pieces um, they have the most amazing craftsmen within the company mm. and, um, but they are not a, a company of designers as it were so I think mm. we're, we're you know they they need the kind of creative input that we offer and we mm. very much need them to not only to produce but also to to find the the right way of making something and um, that's where it, it you know, product design is a, is um, the newest part of, of my design journey. It's now been a few years and it's been a, a, a fun and interesting uh, period, but, but um, I'm still learning so much. So mm. you show up on, on uh, in the workshop and, and see the prototypes and, um, and talk with the people who are actually uh, running the machines in terms of what is mm. possible and what is not possible. Mm. And has, their expertise. Exactly. The, yeah. Like we said on site, it's the same thing here. You know, we um, on on a building site, you've got to trust um, uh, the people on site because they, in in their particular expertise, they know a lot more than you do. Yeah. And it's yeah. exactly the same thing here, um, whether it's the materials or how to produce something. So um, it's 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 a, it's a proper collaboration for yeah. us as well in the office, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Filippo working together and. Yes, I should mention. So the, um, I have a, a partner in crime. So uh, <laughs> Filippo Castellani, um, uh, Italian, living in London, is um, um, joined uh, the business freelance to work with me and, and, and get my ideas out. And together, that partnership has grown into something where we he's now part of the business, and okay. and what we work daily on on um, new ideas and and. Uh, bringing them to to other brands. Mm. Was was there anything in in that collection that that pushed Parada's um, craftspeople to to do something that they hadn't done before, and and vice versa? You know, had you been working I with think, different materials? For, for me, it was I uh, going around the workshop, fully understanding what you can do with solid wood, and and you know when to use solid and when to. Um, veneer something was was really interesting the first time around and just mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. modern CNC and then adding kind of um, hand finishing um, just exactly how what amazing kind of shapes and and, um, and beautiful curves you, you can produce so that I they taught me so much um, I think potentially the the last collection we did which is a, a collection of small tables called Ekara which Mm. Incidentally, is the the island. It's named after the island I grew up on. In, in this, oh. <laughs> um, that had a, a tricky bit in that you saw the pictures earlier. The they ha it has these marble bases, and um, it was a tricky thing to figure out um, the weight of these in order for for them not to be too heavy to lift, but not uh, too light to tip over. And right. I think that pushed them slightly. They, they hadn't worked with marble um as a as a kind of um structural material before it, it's often kind of a, a decorative material as a tabletop on top on top of something mm -hmm. but this was intrinsically part you know part of the structure but i was also going to say i think what we bring with us um as interior designers mm -hmm. is answers to the questions of living that families have so we are very very practical mm -hmm. i don't like mm -hmm. um follow up complaints from my family saying, you know, this happened, this dining table isn't fit for purpose, this coffee yeah, table yeah. has a scratch on it. So I think mm. for your coffee tables, introducing the ceramic top, mm. um, but, you know, inside this handworked wrapper, mm. 
was was something that's quite full guard really no, it, it looks beautiful mm, but actually mm. very um robust and yeah family life. and you were able to bring your knowledge of interior design into that because you you know how people actually use it in, yeah. yeah and yeah. i think you know product design um has in the past, not exclusively, but very much been um, kind of industrial designers, product designers and architects. And I think in the last five, 10 years, a lot of interior designers have gone into that field. And I think we come, like Monique said, with a lot of experience on how people live and therefore yeah. what are the gaps that we can fill mm. and what are the mm. products maybe that are missing. Mm. Mm. So, and, and your functional sculpture is very key to, the, to, the, to what you're designing, functional isn't it? Which is, sculpture. yeah, it, yeah, you know, exactly. First, functional right? comes first, yes. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, you also have a, a, a showroom at, at, at Design mm -hmm. Centre um, where you showcase a curated selection of, of work by um, other brands. So you've got Pierre Boone and Giorgetti and Gooby and uh, Basson Fellows. How do you... How do you select who you're going to showcase? Well, it's been a real journey, really. We, we started our first showroom. We opened our first showroom eight years ago now. Mm. And I think it, I, we opened it because I kept on uh, finding all of these wonderful small producers of furniture around the world that we discovered through projects uh, abroad or, or through going to design fairs. Mm. Um, or even just being on a holiday and turning a table upside down and wondering where it's from. <laughs> but in, in discovering these pieces, we, we eventually we felt that we needed a place to kind of put them mm. and, and show them. So it's always been um, a place to showcase um, things that we have discovered. Um, right. but and to, things that resonate with, with yeah. our DNA. So I find mm. it fascinating when I look through our brand partners how many are run by families mm, really how many actually are still you know either helmed by you know by the parents or maybe mm. now it's the the daughter or the grandson you know mm. who, who are running the company because I think what you know the red thread that runs through Stefan's selection um is passion mm. and quality okay and so there's so often this heirloom hand worked mm. um nature i think to the products that you absolutely love that they will stand the test of time okay. mm. not necessarily because they're so plastic or you know um fit for purpose that nothing will age them but actually that they started with such a truth to their material that time will will leave a mark and mm. and that will be okay because it will be a story Mm. We, we call it aging gracefully when, mm. when basically the pieces of furniture is is allowed to get a few scratches and allowed to be to show that it's been loved and uh, often if you, if the design is right and it's not maybe for every single um, product but if um, if you have used a, a, a solid material if it um, if it has a an aesthetic that is somewhat timeless or you know at, at least can last then it's something that can be allowed to grow old gracefully and, and then mm. be part of mm. part of your design or your children's design later on mm. and is, is that part of the, the the synergy you feel with Chikoshi you, you've worked with them on a on a showroom at the, at the design uh, center yes, as well exactly that I mean I, I was going to say um, there's also a commercial side to to having a showroom and um, whereby you know we we have we have a number of brands um, in order to to deliver contemporary and and uh, modern furniture to all of our clients, but we have uh, a number of very unique and very special partnerships, and that's where you know I would I would count Chicotti as kind of at the top of that list really. Where and this is the Chicotti showroom, this isn't is, it? So this is. Yeah. A, a tall guard run showroom but it's a it's a mono mm. brand showroom at, at the design center and Franco Chicotti and I met I think maybe 12 13 years ago and even though his English isn't um isn't fantastic it's than your Italian it's <laughs> not, it's not, um we managed to have this amazing conversation about design and it was you know I, I then also um had a walkthrough of the of their um, 
I don't even want to say factory because it's it's not a factory. It's it's a it's a workshop, but it's it's a rather big workshop, right. and um, it's um, you know the, the the quality and the, you know you, you see these people, these men in their sixties, often um, working away at these incredibly um, difficult pieces of furniture to make, mm -hmm. and you realize that Franco is is more passionate than any other person I've ever met. You know, he, he can't be away from the workshop for more than a day, then he misses the smell of wood and, and, and he needs wow. to walk around the pieces. You know, I think he counts the furniture as well as the, um, the other gentlemen in the, in the workshop and um, as his friends. So mm. I think, you know, he, his passion was always to find these um, the unique, elegant, but very modern pieces of design. He, he mm. pushed, um, Italian um, furniture on um, in this particular area of, of Tuscany, which was always quite traditional in terms of furniture. And he's, he pushed mm -hmm. it on um, into these, you know, solid materials. So you've got bronze, you've got um, stone, you've got um, walnut um, and just created these beautiful sculptures of them, mm. but functional ones. Mm, of course. <laughs> and that, that, you know, that's been a lovely, um, a relationship with you. Do you and do you think just sort of thinking about what what's happened to us all this year where we communicate in our in our in our little zoom boxes um which obviously has enabled um events like this to happen and and the collaborations to continue but i wonder whether you know post pandemic we're going to kind of have such a desire to get back to to face to face in real life um you know meetings and whether we can expect to sort of explosion of creative collaborations because we've all been apart from each other for so long. What what do you think? <laughs> what do you think? Oh, I, miss, I, I'm, I'm, yeah. I miss people so much. Mm. Um, I can't wait for meetings again. It's funny. I, we used to try and say no to everything to protect mm. our family life. And now I just mm. can't wait to say yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, will, I will go to anything. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, but, but that maybe that's me. I'm the extrovert in the family. So. No, I, I think I think it's it's kind of enough now. It, we've, we've made this work um, uh, really well. I think as, as an industry and, and, mm. and other industries as well, we we, we suddenly we were given um, this tool, and I think we we've, we've done well with it. You know, we have um, morning calls, um, we have weekly calls, we have. Um, you know, between our teams and, and the business, the, the different divisions, we have presentations. We obviously listen to lots of our wonderful suppliers have recorded videos or, the, or they give um, live presentations to us. So I think we've, we've done what can be done really. And I think mm -hmm. we've all realized that going forward, there's, there's, there's a bit of work that can be done that way and actually mm -hmm. be done better or, or, or more efficient. But there's a huge part uh, of of the creative work of, of a designer that, you know, these collaborations that we're talking about that are that are very tricky to have um, uh, over the, over Remotely. Into, yeah. you know, Absolutely, because it's about, it's about people and, and human yeah. relationships yes. and things, isn't human it? Yeah. And if, hopefully it's just made us hugely grateful um, yeah. and, and, and that we will, you know, be more caring and considerate and grateful for those going forward. Yeah, well, let, let's hope that's a positive note to end on. Moni, Safan, thank you so much. It's been fascinating to talk to you, from, you know, from Zoom box to Zoom box. And uh, we hope to see you at the Design Centre really soon. Yes. Well, thank you so much. Thanks so much. Pleasure.